Scotty Braun and AJ Pruszynski running Legends Territory today. This is the home for the best interviews with former players, and you can get more info at baseballalumni.com. This is also in audio form wherever you get your podcasts. And next up, we have a gold glove first baseman who racked up over 1,000 games in the bigs, 271 batting clip, 360 on base, an Olympic gold medal winner and World Series winner, and apparently only five human beings have ever accomplished both and your former teammate. First of all, before we bring him in, legends? This is supposed to be legends. That's okay? harsh. That's harsh. This is supposed to be legends, not like little fat kids that played baseball. This is going gotta, to be a legendary a interview. Gold medal, okay? Stop it. Doug Benkavich <laughs> joining us right now. You can see the relationship between Jealousy's Doug a bitch. and AJ. <laughs> <laughs> tell him. Tell him. How you doing, man? Fuck, always hating. Uh, I, awesome. Uh, just kind of hanging out down in the Florida Keys, coaching high school, which is like pulling teeth uh, this generation. Uh, I always joke around. My son's team is like, if you, you can envision the t- the guys at the Bad News Bears cut, that's those are my starting nine. So other than that, uh, it's like you know, like we never left. AJ's dumbass and his you know constant badgering is just part of his love for me and his affection for me. So it goes a long way. Gotta love it. Well, um, let's, let's start then with your experience with AJ. Um, huh. Where do we start? I mean, geez, I, as we a, have as a good warm up time Scott. as a good warm up to get into things. Yeah. Uh, no. And like, I'll be serious for like 30 seconds. Like, honestly, I, I got him right away. Um, I knew he was a pain in the ass. But at the end of the day, like I always say this, I was lucky to play with uh, great catchers, Piazza, Posada, Veritek, uh, you know, Maurer. The, the list goes on and on. But if I had to win one game, there's no, there's not even a doubt. There's no question. I, I always joke around with guys. I'm like, AJ would take his mom out on a second base on a double play. And that's what I want. And that's how I was. So I always stuck up for him, no matter, even if it was painful to do, and it was painful too many times to put to put up with him. But uh, I knew when the game started, he had my back, and I had his, and uh, lack of anything better. I think by through default, we became friends because no one really cared for me, and no one really cared for him, so we became tight, and, and uh, here we are, whatever, seems like 80 years later, we're still, the banter never stops. And you're, you're both very opinionated, okay? I, I want to start there, and then we can backtrack to some career stuff. I want to go current. So let, let's pop up a tweet, for example. I need an explanation on this one. Baseball wants to know what's wrong. Look at all the cheaters and frauds they have running it or on TV. Weird how some haven't won since being caught. Some on TV are even worse. Biggest frauds in the industry. Well, I can see why you two are friends. You are opinionated, <laughs> Doug. <laughs> yeah, it's, I've been fired several times because of it. Uh, you know, it's funny. I've been hired by organizations in the past. We want you to do exactly how you were treated as a player. We want you to coach exactly how you were brought up. And then when you do it, they're like, you can't say that. I'm like, well, I thought we were in the trust tree. And what, what happened? Like, and I'm the one stuck holding the grenade. So I just feel like you look around baseball and you're like, you know what? You don't believe that. You don't you just stop, like stop being a fraud. I mean, look, I've known A-Rod since I was 13 years old and I stuck up for him through thick and thin. I, I swear to God, I got a year service time in 2007 with the Yankees just to put up with this shit. And it's like, wait a minute, this guy, come on, stop it. He cheated his ass off. Everybody hated him. He pays people to stand outside his courtroom and now everybody loves him. It's like, you know, I, I look, I like J-Lo too, but she can't resurrect. I mean, she's not the Lord himself. She shouldn't be able to resurrect this guy. And now he's on Fox and whatever he is, ESPN. It's like, come on, man. Like, stop it. Like, just stop. Stop with it. I, I, I can't. I cringe when he opens his mouth because half of it's true and half of it's false. And it's just like, and that's not just him. It's like, bless his heart for resurrecting people to like him. That's all he cares about. The difference, I think, for me I don't give a shit if you don't like me. If I make you better as like as a coaching person, like if I make you better, I could give two shits. You're not supposed to be liked as a coach. You're supposed to be respected. And that's the bottom line is sometimes I always said say this about like AJ's in that book too. We say what other people want to say and don't care about the repercussions. Good or bad, right or wrong. Uh, like I always feel like 
when people ask, they read a quote, and I'm like, well, this is exactly what he means. That's not what he's mean. It's not what he's saying. He's just trying to be correct. And in today's day and age, you have to watch what you say and watch what you do. And it's like, you know what? Fuck that. That's not honesty. So on the A-Rod front, going back to that for a moment, you guys, like you said, were friends, knew each other Wait, where, growing oh, up. On. Weren't you his uh, tight end? Or what? Yeah. Tight end? Broke state record, broke school records and almost went to all state football together. And yeah, I mean, basketball too. And you kind of, you know, like I said, it, it's just, it's painful. I can't, you know, it's like, wait a minute. Like, do you not forget you got suspended 200 games? And it's like, come on, man, like, stop it. Like, you know what? I, I get it. I played a power position. I didn't have any. Uh, did it cross my mind? Yeah, of course you thought about it, but I was like, you know what? I, I want to be able to walk when I'm 50 and not, you know, and it, it, I, it was a different, I don't, I don't really point fingers, but I mean, I just look at like USA baseball as much as I love them, you know, the WBC, Andy Pettit's their pitching coach. It's like, come on, man. Like, and everybody's like, Oh, well, you know, he came out and, and came out and said, you know, he, he apologized. Well, no, you got caught, bud. And then you apologize. So don't come out and say you were honest in the start. And I get it. You know, I get why guys do it. I mean, if it was legal, I think we all would do it. It's like you want to get back on the field. You're paid to perform. You're you're not getting – you still get paid, but you want to be – you want to earn the money that they gave you, right? You want to be back on the field. But it's like this whole like, well, he came out and he said this bullshit. No, you got caught, bud, and then you came out and admitted it. So don't – like no one's ever come up the first and be like, hey, I took this, uh, you know, suspend me. But it's like, you know, and, and, and there's no one to blame with the game because they, they keep – they keep rewarding these guys and you know, the list goes on and on the guys that get contracts afterwards and all this other stuff. Now they're back in the game and it's like, wait a minute, wait. And they're, they're now they're talking about it. And it's like on TV, you're like, wait a minute, stop. You know, it's like, you know, Millar's an old teammate, but it's ironic how he, he works for MLB network and he was a replacement player. It's like, I mean, am I the only one that sits back and thinks this shit? It's like, it's just, it's just, it's, it's mind, it's mind number. Well, in fairness, like, what, what would you want them to do? Or is it more on the league side? Because, I mean, they're just trying to live their lives and they're getting job offers or they're- Of course, for jobs I, I, that they're I, I said, I'm not, I'm not here bashing them, but it's like all these things are, it's, it's what's, how come it's legal now? And everybody says, oh, I'm sorry. And now, of course, those guys have a job. They want to, they give it to them. Of course, you're going to take it. But at the same token, it's like, you know, everybody's wondering what's wrong with the game. It's like, well, just look in the mirror. I mean- no offense, for example, if your loved one needed heart surgery, would you take him to a veterinarian? I like that's basically what we're what what's and I I lived it for over a decade as a coach. It's like my goodness gracious! Like I've never seen a sheet of paper fix a guy's swing in my life. You know, I you know the thing when we came up it was like I wanted to hear experience. I wanted to hear about what were you thinking and how did you get better and how this at bat or whatever, you can't do that. They just look at a piece of paper and be like, you know, your launch angles your is whatever. And you're like, well, that doesn't help me. That, that doesn't, I get it. I know I hit ground balls, but I don't, if I hit pop-ups, they don't go very far either. So I, I need to be, I want instant like knowledge from a guy who's actually stood down the barrel at 60 feet, six inches and realize how hard it is that there's other factors that go into, it's like the AAA manager. Is he ready? Well, shit, I don't know. Like, I know he's dominated this level, and there's only one above this one. I don't know how he's going to react to the third deck and the guy throwing 100. And, you know, when he, you bring him in his first inning and he's got to face Pedroia, David Ortiz, and whoever, I don't know how he's going to react. I know he's dominated this level, but huh, I can't predict the future. If I did, I wouldn't be here. I'd be, you know, I'd be, I'd be some naked chick feeding me grapes on a yacht somewhere. But that's not, that's not, <laughs> that's not our job. We have to just tell you what we see. He's dominated this level. There's only one more to go. You got to try it, and you got to give them. You got to give them, you know, a rope to where they can hang themselves and get back up. And you know, I watched the one you guys talk about the kid from St. Louis. What possible good does he do going back to AAA? He's already shown you. He proved it. He played there. He's going to prove it there too. It just takes time. Just because kids don't get it at the speed that you want them to get it at, doesn't mean they're not getting it. I want to take you back to the Royd conversation for a moment because this is an open forum. So for <laughs> you. I mean, you're throwing out being heated about guys and their involvement in the game and, you know, allegations or suspensions or whatever it is. So where do you think it is now on that front? And then you know, what can you tell us about 
how prominent it was and what the lifestyle was like on any of your past ball clubs? I mean, it was, it was, I mean, AJ knows it was, it was everywhere. We saw it everywhere. I mean, you know, I remember my first, my first reaction to it was I was a diehard Lenny Dykstra fan. I love the 86 Mets and he was a smaller stature, strong, but smaller on the Mets. And all of a sudden he gains 35 pounds in an off season. And you're like, Man, he really worked hard. <laughs> like, but then again, you're like, hang on a second. He really did like, some bench press. And then you start back lifting weights. You're like, well, shit, I can't do that. Like, he's magical. He's, you know, he's a he's a dinosaur. I don't know. He's mythical. And then you start seeing around the league, and you're like, uh, all right, you know what? Like, you know, Brett Boone comes to first, smelling like a brewery, and you're like, hang on a second, dude. You're doing shit that, like, I get it. I, I mean, I, like I said, I, I. You just, I, it didn't bother me though. I just, I, I didn't, I didn't, it never came up in my head going, wow, you know, look at that. Because like for every guy that was successful on them, there was 15 or 20 that didn't make it that were on them that still weren't good. So you had to be good to do it. It did it make you maybe stay stronger longer. Absolutely. From what I've talked to the guys that have, but there are a lot of guys in the minor leagues that were juiced up that sucked. So it wasn't like, it wasn't like it made you this, this magical, like, pitcher or this you know all-star iconic hitter you had to hit in order to use this stuff why didn't you tell why didn't you make me do steroids Doug? that's what i want to know <laughs> why didn't you make me and you well because you know I, I always like you stupid. hit balls farther in bp but you hit queefs <laughs> in the game i'm like you, oh, that's you, fine you you know you know you, i love the full swing over the third baseman's head and then talk shit to the pitcher going i own you and i was like that's, that's awesome like that's, that's awesome right. But AJ, I will say this: you did hit balls farther than anybody ever saw in BP up until I went to Boston, and it's like you and Stelly going out in BP was epic. You know, it's like you'd <laughs> wait to hear it bounce off the off the stairs, like "Hang on, Stelly, bong," and like, "Yeah, they got that." Just, but that was, but then he'd get in the game and he'd be Latoya right. Jackson hitting like little dribblers through the hey, hole, and, it would, hey, like, and Tori like, used to say, "I just can't say, hit." As Tori I just used can't to say, hit. "Huh?" Tori used to say, "I was Reggie Jackson in batting practice and." Janet Jackson in the game. Janet, like, okay, it worked out. Okay. It worked out. <laughs> uh, I'll never forget that. I'll never forget though when we lived together in spring training, and you were like, "I'm gonna hit 30," and I, I swear to God, I almost choked to death because I was like, "No, you're not. No, you're not." Yeah. And you knew 27. Like, 27. When it was, was close. In my book, that's 30. Come. In my book, that's 30. But you literally said it. You were sitting there in the middle of spring training. You're like. I'm gonna hit 30. Like it's just I I figured like I got it. Like I got this. And then I whatever lost it. it is, you were and then I lost it. I figured it out, <laughs> and, then, and then I just I went away. I was like I was shocked. I was like, damn, yeah, that. I go if you hit 20, that's doing some shit. As many innings as you caught, and I was like, shit. But I said, damn, he's gonna do this damn thing. And I, you know, this the, it shows that like it, that's a great example of what experience does for you. You learned yourself. You learned your swing. You took coaching. You took the good. You didn't listen so much to the like what didn't work for you, and then voila! At the end of the year, you, at the end of your career, you kept getting better and better and better. And you know, like I don't give you compliments very often, but like the one thing that made you you was the fact that you never wanted to come out of a game. I remember the picture you sent me with your blown out rib cage, and you're like, "Is this normal?" I'm like, "You look like you got you fell off a motorcycle." I'm like, "Yeah, you go. I'm not a doctor, but you might want to get that looked at." And then <laughs> voila! You know, three days later, you're still playing, and like now you get a kid that breaks his fingernail and he has to go to the, gets, he gets, you know, medevac to the hospital and a helicopter. Hey, what, what's wrong with, with your boy Millar that you played with working with the league? I just have a problem with the like, replacement guys. You know, I don't have a problem with Kevin at all. I, I just, it's just, it's ironic that he works for MLB network or he did. I don't even pay attention to it anymore, but, and he was a replacement guy. It's like, well, which one is it? You know, it's like, you know, you, you're, I get it. You, you, I wouldn't, you know, I get if you're, you know, if you're working and someone's going to hand you money, you take it. But at the same token, I just think it's, it's kind of funny how it, you were, you weren't allowed to be on the pictures or the, you know, the t-shirts and all that stuff. And then voila, I, I think it's a great dynamic for him and for what he, for who he is. And it's, it's comical and all that other stuff, but it's just, it's ironic that, you know, it's ironic that A-Rod does, Major League Baseball games, and it's ironic that Kevin Millar works a replacement player works for MLB Network. Have you spoken to those guys, especially like A Rod? You talked about earlier, like you grew oh, up no. with him. No, 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 no. Let me ask you this question: When you see Alex, because I know you, you live, you, you still, he still sees Alex, right? Does uh, he, occasionally. Does, does he acknowledge you? In a certain setting, 
Like if it's a baseball study and if we're doing stuff for Westminster, our high school, yeah, if he's not sleeping at the table. Like my like we honored my our coach for his <laughs> three millionth win and there he is in his Timberwolf shirt sleeping in a chair. And it's like, come on, man. Like, you know, I, I it just <laughs> I always said that he's gonna die a lonely man. Cause you know what, this whole like, you know, father of the year stuff, God bless him for his daughters, because it's gonna come a long way, but uh, it's like you're just trying to get into heaven now. Like, I, I, and that's the part. Like, I'm still friends with my high school team. We still text often, not as often as we should, but we still text group thread, constantly bad badgering each other. And it's just, you know, he's just distanced from it. And that's, I don't care how good or how great you become and how far your career goes, you all, you never forget your high school dudes. Like, that's just like your high school and your college teammates are, are, are like they're brothers till the end. And we still talk and we still, we still shoot the shit, but like, you know, he's just nowhere to be found. Even when we do high school stuff for our coach, it's like, he's just, you know, like I said, he's, I have a picture of him sleeping at the table <laughs> in his Timberwolves shirt. I'm like, are you serious? Like go Wolves. <laughs> what, what was he like? No wonder they suck. <laughs> <laughs> what was he like in, in high school then? Like, did he change a lot as a person? Cause you guys were tight in high school now. Yeah, I mean, I will say he was institutionalized. He's been told what to say and how to say it since he was, you know, 10 years old. You know, it's like you ever watch him do an interview. It's like, oh, hey, Pat. And like, you don't know Pat. Pat don't know you. Like, you you know, it's like, but then who am I to argue? This guy's hanging out with Warren Buffett. So um, he's on Shark Tank, for God's sakes. Uh, but like, he just, you know, he had, like, the funny thing is he had no sense of style. He would, he'd get, we'd all be coming to my parents' house. It was our kind of our gathering place. And We'd all go there before we go out. One, because my dad would buy 50 cases of beer and it was easy to take one and he wouldn't notice it was gone. And then it was, it was a gathering place for everybody. Alex would show up with this like purple and black polka dotted shirt. I'm like, dude, take that off. Like, I'm not going to get caught you anywhere near around you wearing that shirt. So take that off. Go get a shirt and joke around. Like, he still owes me a, a shitload of money for the wardrobe that he stole from me. But not that I'm some fashion you know, guru, but that <laughs> shit was tired. And, but that's just who we were. It was, it was goofy. And I think the number one thing in all seriousness in 2007, I'll never forget this. Like, it was like day three of spring training. And like I'm in, I'm with the Yankees, no seven. And all of a sudden, I'm stretching on my own. Kind of, I knew Johnny, and I knew the guys from playing against him. But all of a sudden, I noticed like Derek started coming closer and Posada started coming closer. And I just was kind of like minding my own business. And they were like, Posada came up to me. He's like, "We should have brought you here years ago." And I'm like, "For what?" Like, he's like, "Alex is completely different around you." And I'm like, "Well, because I, you, it's on you guys. You guys let him get away with this shit. Like, you call him out on his dumbass stuff. He would do. He'd make a kid carry his glove and his belt, and didn't know where this is. I'm like, "What the fuck? Like, you can't carry your own belt. Like, what's wrong with you? Put it on. Like, no one cares. Like, everybody else here is making thirty million dollars too." And they're just as good as everybody else is. So what's the problem? But I remember like Posada made a huge point, like, man, we should have brought you here years ago. And I was like, well, shame on you for letting them get this way. You guys could have stopped this shit. He's in awe of all of you. That's why he wanted to come here. And, uh, you know, and that was, uh, that was the year, the whole fiasco with the blonde stripper. And I'll, <laughs> I'll never forget this. So we're, we make the playoffs and we struggled all year. We grounded, made it the playoffs. And God bless Jason Jambi. He was like my my twin brother that I didn't know I had. And <laughs> we're taking ground balls and practicing before the playoffs start. And Alex had a phenomenal year. He had like 56 homers, 160 yard reals, whatever the hell it was. And his defense was awesome. And we're taking ground balls during like during BP. And he all of a sudden he starts throwing balls into the stands. And I what's going on? Because it was October now. Well, everybody knew he had struggles in October. And uh, Giambi stands up in the middle of practice goes, hey, you want me to put a blonde wig on and you can bend me over and bang me in the ass? Whatever gets you right, let's go. Like, get your ass back in and get, throw it in your chest. Like, it was, like, it was priceless because, like, no one ever said that shit to him. And it was, like, it was wonderful. It was amazing. I was, like, that's – I, like, spit up. I was, like, did you really scream that across the field in the middle of a practice? So, uh, a lot of good stuff that year. A lot of, like, you know, uh, I watched you guys. The gold thong thing, legitimately true. I wore it. Um, best thing in the world. I, I was struggling my ass off and every day I was begging to wear it. I'm like, gee, come on, man. And G would go to Derek and be like, Derek would always say he's not ready yet. Cause I was hitting balls hard. I just wasn't getting hits. And 
I'm like, come on, man. Like, I, I need it. Like, and I, so we play Boston, and I'm hitting like well under two. I'm maybe 170, 180. And I get the bases loaded like three times. I pop up to the catcher twice and punch out. And here come the boo birds. I'm like, F I was booing myself. Uh, so we have a day game the next day. And, and I walk in the clubhouse, and Jeet goes, it's time. And I'm like, thank God. So, boom, I put it on. First at bat, first and second, Joe Torrey's got me bunt. I'm like, cool, I can do that. I, I can do that in my sleep. So, long story short, pass ball, got second and third. Now I'm hitting, and I hit a home run. And I was, like, running on the bases, like, floating. I'm like, holy shit. And Jeet's, like, laughing at me the whole time. And I'll never forget this because I'm holding the guy on on first the next half inning. And, obviously, the fans are so close at the old Yankee Stadium. And I'm spread out, kind of holding the guy on first. And I can hear people in the stands going, is that, is it, what is, th is that? And I literally, in the middle of the game, I turn and go, yep, that's what it is. It's exactly what it is. It's a gold thong. And, like, the whole stands, like, fell out crying and laughing. And I was like, yep, I got it. And then from that day on, our, whoa, whoa, our whoa, handshake, whoa, whoa, Derek, and I was whoa, 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 a, was whoa, a whoa, thing whoa, whoa, with whoa. the freaking G-string. Wait, you took, you took your jersey into the gold thong and it was hanging 100%. out? hundred percent. If you're going to do it, go all out, dude. Don't half-ass this shit. Johnny with the whole I didn't put on my skin. Johnny would walk around in a butt naked doing pull-ups. So I don't want to hear this crap. No, he said that. He said it when we did it, that he did wear it during the game. I wore it straight freaking who, straight under. Who I put my jock thing? over it. Let, let's, let, I, I was that bad that I was like, I'm wearing it. I'm, I, who, I didn't want to give it back. Thing? Huh? Who washed this thing? Did someone wash it? I don't thing? care. I don't <laughs> care. It, at that point, I needed to hit so bad it didn't bother me. It had a, it had like a tool shed, like the tool shed waistband on it, and it was like gold sequence. So it was like, and it was, you know, like I said, the fans are so close; they know you could see it through my through my pants. Wow. And I was like, "Hey, man, whatever, dude. Whatever. I hit a bomb today, and I don't hit them very often. So I'm I'm happy. I wanted to wear it every day for the rest of the year." And they, they, you know, G's like, no, it's it's only for special occasions. I, I got to get a little more insight then on on Jeter because wait, did G, wait hold on did Jeter wear the the thing? Yeah, yeah, exactly. he wore it. Yeah, he wore it because we don't get much from him. Like, yeah, give give me. Did he wear? I'll give you, I'll give you the Derek Jeter story from of all of all Derek Jeter stories. Okay, okay. so. Oh boy. Hold on, let's not get you in trouble now. Like, I don't no, want. To, I'm not getting in trouble. This no, is, this I don't want great. you. To, I don't want Derek Jeter to have to like call you and say, "Hey, Doug, what the hell, man?" Like, no, this one, this, this one, this one's, this one's, this one's, this one's like people don't realize this is a good one. This is one of the best ones I've ever had. So, we're in 07. We're in the playoffs, and walking up the tunnel. Long story short, a cameraman slipped and fell on my ankle. Like, rolled it completely horribly. I I broke my wrist that year. I fought like hell to get back. I got back. Had a great September. Starting game one in Cleveland, CC, whatever. So um, we lose the first two games. The one game is the bug game where shit was crazy. And uh, we're on the flight back. And Joe came up, was walking through the plane. It was like, usually how Joe did it was if you drew straws for the veteran guys who had to come in on media day to take the media. And I was like, Joe, my ankle's a mess. I'll, I'll do the media. No problem. Let, let these guys sleep. I'll do it. I'm already going to be there. So whatever. So he's like, cool. And he's like, you know, what would be a good idea. And that was the game that the bugs came out and Joe goes, you know, you should say like something about that. We all had like Derek had Derek Jeter driven cologne on and Derek Jeter driven just came out. And so I was like, sure, we'll fire it out there. And I did it with the, you know, the media guys did the same thing. You have to do it. So like, Matter of factly, I was like, yeah, the rumor is that we all had Derek's clone on and all the bugs showed up. So game three rolls around and Derek always talked to me. I was always, always like a consummate, like captain, right? He was always worried about everybody and taking care of everybody and joking and having a good time and making sure everybody's focused. He yeah. don't speak to me. And him and Posada were like the old guys in the Miller Lite commercial. Like they always like stir the pot and walk away. And Posada comes up to me, he's like shaking his head. He's like, mm, you, you, you fucked up, man. And I'm like, I, I don't recall what I did. So the game goes by. He doesn't talk to me the entire game. Like doesn't even look at me, which is unlike him. Did our handshake, but it was like kind of at a 3% when usually it's 120. And so the game's over, nothing happens. The next day, it's game four. I walk into my locker and on the chair is a Macy's like Manila folder. 
I open it up and it's a professional letterhead that says like Macy's, whatever, uh, and something to the effect of due to your comments on the whatever date it was in the New York Times or New York, whatever it was, daily, we've had to pull 2.7 million bottles of Derek Jeter driven off the shelves. And my heart sinks because like all I want to do is come back and be a Yankee. I missed half the year. I feel like this is the place for me. I can hit lower on the order and do my thing and play defense and win a championship. And and I'm crushed. Like, I'm my, this is the playoffs. We're an elimination game. And I'm, like, sick. And Jer- Derek won't even talk to me. He won't even look at me. So I go into Joe's office. He's like, man, you fucked up. I'm like, Joe, you fu- you helped me. Like, you told me to say it. Like, so I'm, like, freaking out. So we go on the field. And always Derek leads us out, right? He, he's the first one out of the dugout. And I I was trying to, like, always right behind him because first base is right there. And he runs out. And he's. I run it. He runs the first, and he kind of stops, and he goes, "That letter is all bullshit." And I'm like, "Are you fucking serious?" Like I took the ball and I spined him, like right in the back. I go, "Look, I know these playoff games are easy for you, but I'm shitting the brick here. Like, I, 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 these games are stressful. I'm freaked out, and you think it's one big joke." And like, I look over, and like everybody's in on it. Joe's smiling. Posada's laughing under his mask, like the whole game. I'm like, dude, this isn't funny. And we end up losing, but that was like, people had no idea like this was going on. And I was like shitting a brick. Cause I was like, I just ruined my chance to be a Yankee. I, you know, I dissed Derek Cheater and the, the press about his cologne and all this stuff. And he wouldn't talk to me. So I was like, I was devastated. And I realized it was a joke. I was like, I'm the big, I'm so gullible. Like I deserve that wait, for sure. Wait. And then you're in Pittsburgh the next year. Is that right? Oh, I went right to Schittsburg. Yep. Yep. <laughs> they got you. I tell you what, they boy, got you. you. Tell you what, career is really. I mean, when you go from the starting first base for the Yankees to the utility guy for the Pirates, no career has ever gone better than what in a six month span than that shit. <laughs> so, okay, so I never heard. I've actually never heard that story, which is great. But which leads me to a question now that I have. So Scott doesn't know. No one knows the story except for Doug and I. So that was 2007. You said. Mm-hmm. 2008, Doug and I go to the national championship game, Florida, Oklahoma. Oh. Okay. So, I don't know. Let's probably get Doug in trouble. I don't care. 2008, we go to the national championship game, Florida, okay. Oklahoma, in Miami. We go to his house. We fish. Then we go to the game. We, the game was at 8 o'clock. We got to tailgating at 10 a.m. Okay. Oof. The whole day, 10 a.m. And we had a big old thing. We had ESPN, the magazine come in, do they throwing cheerleaders up, and I'm looking going, God, which one do I catch? Because there's four of them look flying down. I mean, they're taking pictures. We had the band. Remember, they had the Florida band oh. come through with the cheerleaders and stopped, and they did a whole thing for this. It was crazy. So the game goes, whatever. At one point, I get a tap on my shoulder, and it's my wife, and she goes, are you going to do something about him? I'm like, what? I'm watching the game. She's like, no, you need to look. And Doug's jumping over the chair trying to fight the guy in the stand. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> right? And I'm like, well, he'll be fine. And I'm, I'm at a Gator game. game. Like, I'm miserable. Yeah, I'm he went to Florida State, miserable. so he didn't give it. He, he didn't care. So after the game, we hang out, and I was driving us back to his house. And, <laughs> you know, stopped drinking, driving home. It's like 2 in the morning. Boom, we're driving home, and we get off the exit for his house in Miami. And you know where the Mar- – or the – not the – the Dolphin Stadium is? It's like a drive to Miami because where he lived in Miami. Miami Garden. It's like a good hour. Yeah. yeah it's a good, so we get off the highway. And I'm driving, and Doug's in front of me, and I'm behind him. We're following him. All of a sudden, I see a cop go by me. And then he turns around, and lights come on. And I'm like, my wife's sleeping next to me. I'm like, oh, boy. So he pulls me over. <laughs> lights, the whole deal. And, and he comes and knocks on the window. And I have my... Pulls you over. Pulls me over. And I see oh, Doug, yeah. Doug go up, and he t- pulls over. And I'm like, oh, I'm here. So I'm sitting there, and knock, knock. Here you go. Roll, roll the window. Yes, officer. He's like, do you know why I pulled you over? And I was like, no. He's like, well, you did, I don't know, you ran the red light or something. I'm like, well, I didn't really run the red light, but okay. He's like, license and registration. Well, I have my cell phone on my leg. And so I try to hand it to him and to give it all to him. And whatever, he checks it and he's like, he pulls it out and he's like, oh, okay. All right, well, can you step out of the car, sir? And I'm like, okay, well, I have my cell phone. I'm like, I get out my cell phone. Boop, boop, all over the ground. Right? So then we're on the ground looking, oh, he found it. We pull it up. He picks it up. Yeah. Can you come to the back of the car? And I said, yeah, <laughs> sure, sure, no problem. I'm, in my mind, I'm like, God, I'm, I'm not drunk, but gosh, like, man, this is going to go bad. Like, this could be really bad. So he, so he goes, you know, I pulled you over. And I said, no. He goes, 
And he takes his flashlight and he goes Phew, on my back of my bumper. And there was like 50 bottle caps from where we had been tailgating. And people had been reaching in my thing, open it, and they were just sitting on my bumper. Because I had a Denali <laughs> and they have that ridged bumper. So they were all just sitting there. And I'm like, I'm like, oh God. And he looks at my lights. He goes, oh, Brzezinski, huh? He's like, oh, you play baseball. And I was like, oh my. So my head, I'm like, oh, I'm going to get out of this bitch. <laughs> and then he goes, too bad I'm a Cubs fan. I was like, damn it. <laughs> my one shot at the whole thing. I was like, this is my one shot to get out of this. Right? So then I'm like, so then I'm like thinking about, all right, can I touch my nose? I'm good. I should I start do like Z, Y, X. You start doing the alphabet backwards. So then all of a sudden another cop car pulls up right behind his and he's, he looks at me and he goes, uh, I'm Doug's friend. This is all a joke. Hurry up and get out of here before you do get arrested. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, what? He's like, no, this is all a practical joke from Doug. <laughs> and I'm like, he goes, get out of here before my supervisor does something. And I like ran to my car, jumped in. Meanwhile, I look up and he's literally like half a block away, and I can hear him laughing with the windows down. <laughs> they're they're sitting there watching this whole thing. Who I'm, taught you that, Jeter? <laughs> I was like, I'm a, I'm a cop buddy, and he's a Gator fan too, so he knows I'm miserable, right? Like, I can't think of oh. two worse teams I have to go watch is OU in Florida. I'm like, somebody fucking shoot me. So. I keep my buddy B calls me. He's like, "Hey, uh, you know, anybody, anything you need for me, you let me know." I'm like, "Matter of fact, you know what? Like, my buddy AJ is feeling pretty good about himself right now." I go, "I go, I, when he turns the corner at 136th Street, you gotta pull him over." And I'm like, "Perfect." And I'm I'm trying like hell to like behind a tree, giggling my ass off. And then the other cop car came, and I'm like, "This ain't a fucking joke. We gotta get out of here." But like Lisa. One, like Lisa punched me harder than any hit I ever took hit by pitch in my life. She's like, that's not funny, Doug. I'm like, Lisa, this is fucking hilarious. I go, when you're over this, you'll like in a couple days, you'll laugh. But right now, I get it. You're oh. mad. I, I, I never laughed so fucking hard in my entire life. I'm like, this is absolutely perfect. I thought I was like, yes. I go, make him start touching his nose. I go, lift his leg up, doing all kinds of shit. I'm like, tell him you're a Cubs fan. This is beautiful. Oh, it was fucking Cubs. priceless. Dude, so my wife was like passed out. She's like... <laughs> In the chair, and all of a sudden I pull over. She's like, "Why are you stopping?" Like she went from like zero to sixty. Like, oh, oh god, who do we call? Oh my god, what are we gonna do? He told she's, like, stop she's like, "You're fine, right?" I'm like, "I'm fine. Speed. I'll be fine." Yeah. She's like, "What did you do?" I'm like, "I don't know. I didn't do anything." Punk. Punk. Oh, it was great. I wish there was a cam. I mean, I don't wish there was a camera, but it was rather powerful. Yeah. All right, so we're gonna press the pause button on this Doug Mankiewicz interview, and we will roll out part two next week, which includes. Stories about what Derek Jeter was really like. Byron Buxton in the minor leagues because Doug managed him there and also would have liked to continue that managing <laughs> in the major leagues. And the real story behind the World Series winning baseball in 2004. Let's hope he doesn't tell any more stories I don't want to tell my mother about what he did the first, first half. Oh, she's watching on YouTube <laughs> and listening. So you can get this wherever you get your podcasts as well. And for more info on your favorite former players, hit up baseballalumni.com. Thanks to the MLB Players Alumni Association for putting this together. And we'll see you for a spicy part two of Doug Venkiewicz next week.